But I wrote a, a, a best-selling book called The Fifth Vital about the opiate epidemic and my experience with heroin addiction. And that uh, that's book a, is, another thing I wanted to talk to you about. has sold 300,000 copies. Wow, it that's amazing. It is a USA Today bestseller. It is one of the highest-ranked books on, on Audible and Amazon. It's got over 5,000 five-star ratings. And I... When I meet people that know me through the fifth vital, it's a dramatically different conversation than yeah. it is for someone who's seen me on the podcast talking about wrestling and 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 crypto, whatever the fuck, or or <laughs> or the night shift, you know. And so, my yeah. big job right now, and the and the the real onus for for twenty twenty three and moving forward for me is being a little bit more responsible to the brand that I'm trying to create long, for for a longevity and for long term, and like not relying as much on the things that I think we all fall into the habit of relying on from time to time. And, and, you know, I've, I've, I've loved all the time that I've spent with, with, you know, the girls that are in the vlogs and, and the food and, and the stuff that I do. And the food is another thing that I'm huge on. And we can talk about that later I as love well. food. But, but, but <laughs> my, my, my potential and, and the ability that I have to create actual change and, and continue on the change that I've actually made already is something that is a responsibility that I need to really take accountability for. You're not so, cold turkey, are you? Uh, no, I don't know what you mean by that. Like, like how did I uh, get clean? Do you, do you, no, no, I meant not with like opiates. I meant alcohol Do you too. like sandwiches? So, okay, so, so <laughs> this is a, this is a conversation that is, is actually really hard for me to have, dude. And, and I, I don't want to have it. We don't have No, to. no, no. I, the thing about me and, and something that I pride myself on is transparency. I, 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 on, I'm, I'm fully transparent about anything. I put, I put everything out there. There's not, I don't put stuff. Same. It's a bad place. idea. Don't do yeah. it. I'm I sure am the same way though. Worse. Go ahead. I have, I have been clean from opiates and oh, and all drugs mm -hmm. since 2010 i got clean on june 23rd 2010 and that includes anything or anything right like completely clean wicked and you know um i it, it wrote about this in my book so it's really i'm not putting anything else out there but i have had my ons and offs with the california sober lifestyle which is basically like okay i can have a casual drink here and there um i am i i do not condone that as a as a you know belief set for someone who is in active recovery especially someone in early active recovery to oh, yeah. even to even attempt something like that i mean i was i was clean and sober for years before i had a drink um and and so it depends on when you ask me i mean if you ask me in 2020 i was sober for the entire year if you ask me on any given month, I could be sober for that entire month. I ask you on Grammy's weekend, you're like, maybe you know, I am, maybe I'm not. Lit up you know, a but bit. it's 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 uh it's another um struggle that I have to deal with as someone who really would like to be a representation of what it looks like to escape an underworld that a lot of people don't know exists, which is a terrible, terrible place and a terrible environment in this country. We have a severe, severe, severe problem. And the, the, the one thing about it is I've always been comfortable in my skin saying that I'm, I'm unfortunately slash fortunately not the perfect representation of, uh, I, and, and, and I, I just, just a, a last thought on it. I believe that's actually a power for me. I believe yeah. that people in recovery or, or that are looking into, at getting into recovery are sick of gurus. They're sick of doctors. They're yeah. sick of perfect examples of, I'm at a meeting every day. My life is this. I do this, 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 and this because life is unpredictable. Yeah. And, and, and honestly, I, I, I'm not a believer of, of, of any kind of one size fits all approach to, to recovery. And so well, that's, that's kind of where I am. I, I agree with that. As someone who had a brother who deeply struggled with addiction, I think the word perfect, like perfect recovery is such a weird oxymoron, right? Yep. Because there, I think there's no perfect situation there like obviously you're living with some kind of trauma or something that is imperfect and so however you're going to make that work and make yourself function and be the best version of you that's your perfect Correct. scenario Correct. i think you are so defensive about this obviously because you don't want to influence choices in other former addicts where they go have a drink and then fall off the wagon and then yeah. you're, you feel responsible for 100 percent. and, and I, i'm just making that clear everybody's going to have their own journey and I think everybody, like, no one can put their journey on anybody else. It, it, you're, that's exactly right. And and honestly, the, the the struggles that I continue to have are are or you know, ons and off periods, whatever you want to call it, are generally me continuing to try to work through trauma. Yeah. And I I have a, a tremendous tremendous amount of 
experience with trauma and, yeah. and ICUs and dead friends and a- anything you can imagine under the sun. I've been cut open a thousand times. I have severe, severe chronic injuries and issues, you know, everything under the sun. And I've seen terrible fucking things. And a lot of it, even before that, a lot of people start using drugs or abusing substances as an escape from something that they're dealing with even from their childhood. And there yeah. was a moment in uh, in Euphoria, which I which I love as a show. I sure. really, really love that show where... Um, uh, why am I drawing a fucking blank on, on uh, Zendaya? Zendaya's uh, name on the show. Uh, Why do I think it's Rue? Ro, Rue, 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 sorry, Rue. Rue. No, I think you're right. Rue, I'm sorry. Grammy's weekend, man. No, Rue, <laughs> where Rue has this, um, has this like uh, epiphany about the first time where she used opiates, and she was like, it was the first time in my life where I finally felt safe in my, in my mind. Hmm. And I related to that moment so much of this idea of all of that struggle with self-worth and, and anxiety and, and depression and all of that stuff that you carry with you, um, feeling like, okay, now I found an escape only to yeah. then find out that, that it was everything but that. Just and it trap. was going to lead yeah. into, into the worst, you know, 10 years of my entire life on this planet. And so, yeah. um, it's, you know, listen, it's just, it's all of us are on this journey together. We're all just continuing to explore and do the best that we can. And, and so I'm, I'm, trying to be as responsible as I can with the storytelling, but, but more than anything, just continuing to tell that story because it has been really beneficial. Yeah. I mean, it's really interesting for me because I had a, I had a brother that was a big time addict and never really let our family know. And my anti-drug was, I remember he was missing for like two, three years, basically showed up out of nowhere and then sat me down when I was probably 14 or 15 years old and gave me like a history of everything that he had been doing. And it was like traumatic just to hear because he's like, you can never tell dad any of this stuff. And just like all of he passed away at the beginning of COVID. My my brother did. But like getting this like history and like graphic detail of like just awful situations like that lives in my head. And you just see the power that opiates have over a person. It's it's there's nothing really like it. No. You know, I mean, there's there's a lot of, uh, you know drugs and a lot of different addictions but it's it's i would know when he was using you know what I oh mean? no like, it's, it's even so just apparent. on the phone uh, on, yeah. when like even when he was like off of it or like he would call me in a normal state i could just tell by the way he was framing things i would be like oh he's, for me it's he's instantaneous using. i can yeah. i mean you can sit me in front of anybody i can tell you exactly what drugs are on i was yeah. i was in that world i mean there, this this world that exists and and back to Jeff and another reason why I do relate to him because he's another person that has seen that that side of this yeah. world. I think like this a lot of times, and this is not a, a dig at anyone, but the the creator set generally tends to be like a pretty. It's well, they're young it's kids that, who make yes, million they're, dollars. They're sheltered. They, they don't even. Shop. They don't. Uh, oftentimes, they don't come from a background where they like fully formed like identities. Uh, through normal struggles that every random individual has in their day to day. And they just go from like being some random dude that doesn't have a lot of friends to just becoming this like super famous person. So their identity is almost built. Yeah. yeah. And then every single interaction that they have after that, it's always going to be because they are who they are and what they bring to the table is going to be like their fame and fortune. So you can't, in my opinion, you can't make like, um, you can't shape your identity around that. And I think they're, and I think the biggest thing that, um, and they don't struggle like the, you said, the, the biggest f- loss for an identity that is simply rooted in, you know, child stardom or, or this, this bubble mm-hmm. that we, you know, play in is, is empathy. And yeah. it's, and it's yeah. something yeah. that I, it is something that I, <laughs> Oh my God, dude, it drives me crazy, bro. I, 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 I feel so deeply when I see people hurting, dude, like, because I know so intimately what it feels like to be at the end. Yeah. I lived there for so long, bro, to to a point where I was sure that I was that this was what my life was. There was no future. There, it was just this is how my life went. This yeah. is how I how I lived and you know, I, I, my mom sat by the phone every night waiting for the call. Like, yo, your son o- overdosed or was shot to death in a, in a deal gone wrong. Like, that was my life. And so when I see these people who are struggling, homelessness, addiction, even the more, you know, what you would call like r- rudimentary struggles of like, of like, have not, you know, not having a, a strong family structure or support system, that, it, 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 it hurts me 
It actually hurts me yeah. in my fucking heart, dude. Like I feel that shit. And you and and I'm not asking for that. I'm not asking for that like direct lineage of, of empathy through this like shared extreme struggle. But it's so hard to see these people that are just muted do it. They are so yeah disassociated from any sort of desire to make someone else feel okay. When I know someone's going hurting. That stops me in my track, dude. Like, I want to help you fix that problem. Now, this has also created another issue for me because if you go through my DMs, it, it's all day. Yeah. They yeah. send their suicide yeah. notes to me. Yeah. And yeah. it's a lot to deal with, bro. It's a oh, lot of yeah. pressure to deal I do, with. I do. Trust me. Yeah. I know. I'm sure you guys Well, know we're, we're Twitch streamers, so that's like, you know, that <laughs> comes with it's the our job. DMs, it's our Twitch chats. Yeah. yeah. DM and Twitch chat. Yeah, this, exactly. This they, would be... They're out here ruining Immaculate Friday vibes on a regular basis. Go on, cutie. <laughs> this might be a bit of a, a loaded question, and yeah. feel free to like, n- maybe, maybe you're not. I'll get his ass. Get yeah, his no, 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 no. It's ass. not. Stab it's, him in the chest uh, right it's now. It's gonna be sad, Hassan. So keep your shit together. No, I, I just wonder, as a family member of someone going through this, what can you do? Uh, I think, like, for example, my my mother was addicted to opioids, and we didn't realize for a really long time. Um, until it was, until it was like pretty much too late. Um, and so I, I'm curious, like once you do realize how do you, what's the best way as an addict for like someone that loves you to approach you, if that makes sense. So the question that you're asking right now is like, what would be considered like the million dollar question? Yeah, of course. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it's unfortunately like very complex because you've got two schools of thought, right? You've got tough love. And you've got coddling, right? And Mm -hmm. my belief is that the answer probably falls somewhere in between the two. But coddling never worked for me. And it wasn't until my probation officer told me, uh, after dirty urine, tomorrow morning at 10 a.m., I need you to show up at SCRC Clinic in New Haven, Connecticut, and start a detox program that will then basically lead into rehab oh, wow. or you can come to probation and you will serve out your five year suspended sentence. Those wow. are your two options. And I said, that urine is wrong. I, you, <laughs> that's you not my, wrong piss. that's my brother. She said, she's well, it's addict <laughs> yeah. mentality. And she said, and she said, you're not hearing me tomorrow morning, 10 a.m. I, Ellen, listen to me. Ellen, stop, slow down. There's been a lot going on in my home life. I'm, I okay. I used again. I'm, I'm. I'll fix it. I'll hit 10 a.m. tomorrow. Make a decision. Hung up the phone. Go, Ellen. <laughs> Ellen Ferrari, Milford, Connecticut, probation. Hell yeah. The next day I was at SCRC. Five days puking, shitting, getting wow. off methadone, getting off heroin, getting off crack cocaine. Xan. I was prescribed 90 milligrams of Xanax a month. And 31 days after that, I was at Connecticut Valley Hospital rehab. I got out and I never used drugs again. Wow. And. and I owe my life to her and and my family for the support, and that's and that's honestly. So to answer your question, it's 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 a difficult mm-hmm. answer, um, because I think it will be semi dependent on the person. Yeah. Some people just really need that love. I think me as this rebellious like boy, I needed to to get punched in the face by yeah. re- reality. Um, but but regardless, I think the support needs to be there. Yeah. And I, I think I think. The one thing you see, the recurring theme that you see in this country with both mental illness and addiction is that the people who truly don't get better are the ones that can't find any resource of support. Yeah, of course. Yeah. And, it, 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 and it, we are in a broken system. And I and the saddest, I feel, is for these people who are on the streets with no one, yeah. who have served their country, who have who have been civilian, have been good citizens, and have fallen victim to the to this epidemic that is you know pharma sponsored, whatever you want to call it, and now have no one. They have no family. They've been deserted. The system has forgotten about them. I call them the forgotten ones, and they're <sighs> everywhere. And it is it is extremely sad. Extremely sad. Yeah. The hardest part for my family and I is like a, an addict will lie. Lie. Yeah, They'll lie their lie. fucking ass. <laughs> yeah. I had a so so my brother Bobby like, unfortunately, my family enabled him in a big way. Oh, and like the big one for him was he said this is like <laughs> I'm I'm on earth in it, but like he would always say he was fixing his teeth, and he would ask my parents for money to fix oh. his teeth, so they'd give him like twenty grand at a time. Oh wow, yeah yeah yeah. So he got, he had the, he had, he, that was the original rug pull right there. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. He said he was working on this crypto called <laughs> Crypto <laughs> Zoo. Oh, God. <laughs> oh my God. He was the originator. No, he was the um, OG Zoo, dude. But, uh, it's, it's funny. Cause like just 
from the other perspective, like as a young kid, you carry this stuff just to everybody there. I'm wearing Invisalign right now. And part of that is because I never asked for my parents to fix my teeth. Oh my God. Because I was so, that was, that carried just so much. Because the other thing is like my parents and I never really talked about it. That of was probably course, the worst thing yeah. we could do, right? Yeah. Is that we wouldn't talk about it. If it was ever like, how's Bobby? You'd be like, oh, you know, when we should have been like, oh yeah, he's on smack. You yeah. know what I mean? Like, yeah, yeah. but it's so hard. And I think that's going to be the hardest part for you is like, want to help this person oh my mom's dead so well I, I, i'm just saying for anybody who's, who's listening yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. We'll just try to mine's like dead yeah. That. Yeah, yeah, yeah yeah too late my, on that one my, but. my brother is dead too yeah like, well, well real, we can yeah. fix yeah. them we two will a, fix them two in a row okay well, got grammy it weekend. <laughs> yeah grammy weekend <laughs> but but it's also like for anybody dealing with this it's the question of like how do i help this person yeah while still live a a normal and sustaining life because you're carrying way more yeah, of that yeah. shit around than you think, even if you're a well-adjusted dude, like I'm fucking 33 years old. And I'm fixing my teeth now because when I didn't have money, I couldn't be like, Hey mom, dad, I, cause I knew they would be like, you need are, money you for your money? Are, you, are you doing the heroin? Yeah. Well, but it's, it's, it's just like as a, and, and, like maybe we could, I don't know, switch to something more lighthearted. But but as a, <laughs> no, but no, as a, 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 like on a final note of of where you guys are coming at it from, yeah. Yeah. I I just I the last three pages of the fifth vital, which is so strange for me to have climbed the second mountain that creators have to climb after getting rich. Yeah, before the first mountain, I had no yeah. money when I put the fifth vital out, and yeah. I achieved the impact that I needed to on this planet before wow, I made money. Wow, that's amazing. And so it's been it's been an incredible ride, but the. The last three pages of the book, um, in the last chapter, in the afterthoughts chapter, I had asked the rest of the team that I worked on it with to not touch that chapter. Now, they, sure. they had done a, a certain amount of proofreading, beta reading, yeah. editing, as they would, any you know publishing agency would. And I said, please don't touch the afterthoughts chapter. It's very important to me, very special to me. And the last three pages of the book are letters that I wrote to three different groups of people. Uh, w one being uh, a person who has never known addiction or mental illness. And I basically say, wake up every day and cherish, cherish the radiance that your life is yeah. and, and, and apply that light as much as possible to, to, to anyone that you know that is going through it. Yeah. The second letter I wrote was to people that are family members. And this was the hardest one for me to write because... Mm -hmm. You guys are warriors. You guys are absolute warriors. And like, I cannot imagine watching a loved one go through that because I, I went through it and, yeah. and, and, it, and it was very tough for me to deal with. And obviously, and I still struggle with that, but the idea of there's always some sense of self and, and accountability and hope that exists within every one of us, even in our darkest times. And that sure. light gets very dim. But, but for the most part, we all try to keep that light on, that little ounce of hope. And I can't even imagine what it would be like to be you or to be you in, in that situation and to, and to have to watch someone go through that. Yeah. And so, it's, and so to anybody out there who's, who's you know, watching a loved one, you know, I, I, I just, I, I can't even tell you the, the, the debt that we have to pay to, to you guys as a support system. And, and unfortunately, it's a debt that we'll never repay. You yeah. know, there's no way for us to pay that back. But for the ones that are, are blessed and, and lucky enough or work hard enough or whatever you want to call it to get out of it, you guys are the reason why. You know what I'm saying? And so, yeah. I, I, like, for what it's worth, you know, I, I, I my hat's off to you guys. And I, I, well, I can't I, even imagine what I that's I think that's like. why I've always fucked with you so much is, like, the first time we met, you were just promoting Fifth Vital yep. as, as it was. I think it was just coming out. Yeah, yeah. And I think, you know, ultimately that's the coolest thing about you is a lot of people can, you know, go through addiction or go through a hard time, but you really carried it and you own it. It's not some dark secret. You put it on your sleeve and you have done a ton. And I, and I think that's why, like, I think your radical empathy is different because I think we live in a time where there are Vogue empathies, right? There's groups oh, of people. Sure. Oh my God. It's really popular. <laughs> yes. To, to empathize. Yeah, yeah, right? Oh sure. my and God. Go out there and it's the, the Yaz Queens of the world. And it's like, do you actually empathize with that person? Do you actually care about that person? Are you doing that for Twitter likes or whatever? I think it is much harder to empathize with people who aren't in that Vogue addicts, yeah, yeah. homeless, yeah, you know, for sure. and I think yeah. you wear that. And I think you're such a regular, normal guy that that's why maybe some people have a visceral reaction to you because they're like, Oh, you know, like 
what the hell is this guy about? Because <laughs> their empathy is so performative and yours is so real that they don't understand right, right. that you can come at these things from a, like a, a not, you know, social media yeah, there's perspective. There's no win in it. For, I mean, 